And we're using a, a, a cloud storage for this purpose. Uh, we're using a Cassandra database that lives across Azure and uh, Google Compute Engine. Uh, this could also, you know, reside on premise, uh, but you know, for our scalability purposes and the way that, that we're uh, serving this to our customers, which are, you know, again, mostly in private industry, this really makes a lot of sense for them. Uh, the data is all encrypted at rest inside the Cassandra database, and we're able to, you know, quickly uh, across the uh, entire, well, you know, the, we've customers that have petabytes of, of data that in uh, millions of files that they're now able to quickly search and in a and get results back that are highly personalized in, in a very short period of time. So by taking this approach, uh, you know, essentially we get three main uh, benefits for the, uh, the, uh, the, for the customers that we're servicing. Um, they get the anywhere, anywhere access that you'd expect from something like uh, a cloud storage uh, while being able to keep data on premise uh, in, a, in a NAS uh, type of environment. Uh, they <clears throat> are able to, uh, experience much faster file trans transfer and, sh and sharing using this uh, technology. Uh, the way that we built the product was essentially to start by producing a transport layer that allows you know, very rapid extraction of data from an on-premise environment. And so you know, the customers take advantage of that if they need to move data from uh, long distances and large amounts of data. Uh, and you know, the kind of a cool consequence that you get from having a singular uh, a schema to attach to any source of data is that you can uh, you can then inject that into other you know, type kind of like type SaaS services like Microsoft Office Online. So you can quickly take uh, any file that's living anywhere across the you know enterprise and open it up for for co-editing and co-authoring inside Office Online. Um, obviously, now that you've got a massive uh, you know, Cassandra database that's full of all this metadata, uh, you could take advantage of analytics uh, that uh, are available for that kind of a service. So, you know, particularly we, we adopted the, uh, the SMAC uh, stack, which includes Cassandra as a piece of it, but also has Spark. Uh, and the nice thing that we can do there is uh, enable a very personalized, individualized search for each user uh, with that advanced analytics. And, you know, what we've been finding is that the customers that we've we've deployed this to are really happy with with the uh, with with the uh, the speed that they're getting responses back and the personalization of the response. So, uh, if there's a particular piece of information that they're looking for, you know, keep in mind this is you know this this is uh, something that we've been seeing across industry for quite a while. Uh, as these data sources grow, uh, people are spending way more time looking for data than actually doing work. Uh, and it's been, you know, some of the stats that we've seen are something like 20% of people's time is spent just looking for that file that they don't remember if they left it on Dropbox or if the latest version was in an email uh, or whatnot. So uh, it's definitely helped, uh, you know, our users to, to be far more productive. And finally, yeah, the last piece that uh, we find really interesting that we're, we're kind of driving into this uh, as our next endeavor is around audit and governance. So now that you have all this information about access patterns, the usage of, of data, uh, you can do some fast analytics and discover, you know, say some, some usage patterns or patterns of behavior that uh, may indicate you've got a leak in the environment or you've got a hacker that's penetrated in the environment. Uh, so, you know, essentially being able to attach to all these different sources of data, you know, extract all the metadata into a sing single centralized place and very quickly keep that up, metadata index up to date uh, really gives you a lot more power for what kind of services you're able to deliver on top of a really star large uh, 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 namespace for a, any organization. So that's all I had. <laughs> it was kind of a whirlwind. So, you know, please, you know, if anyone has a question, let me know. Okay. Th thank you, Mitch. I'm going to ask, uh, I'll ask a quick first question. Can you give us like a, like the, the one minute or 30 second one minute just rough, you know, at a high level that, that you're comfortable with? Uh, just kind of where, where does the technology sit and how, roughly kind of how it, how it works? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll give it really quick. So essentially, you know, imagine you've got a virtual appliance or an agent that's running uh, on, on premise or in the cloud if you're attaching to a cloud silo. Uh, the agent, you'd think of it like a, a scanner, indexer, and language processor. Uh, and that, you know, think of that as, as the, you know, 
the singular agent that's going to be feeding all of the, the disparate sources up into a centralized cloud. And the centralized cloud is where that index is stored and keyed based on uh, you know, our, our customer ID and, and uh, you know, other sources to make sure that you know, we're not cross-pollinating. But you know, the, the cool thing is that we can actually take that, that massive store uh, that's across multiple of our customers. So you know, we're, we're talking about the, the order of billions of, of uh, file objects at this point. And we can actually do machine learning across the entire, uh, uh, the entire set of data and not have to singularly attach onto a single customer or a single data silo to try to understand the patterns of, of behavior. So. I actually have a million questions, but I'll just ask you a couple. Firstly, it sounds totally clever. I love it. Um, to the question of where it sits, does it run on every desktop, or does it, is there a place centrally where it can gather all the good stuff? So for, for right, it can run on every desktop. We have, to, we have deployed that way in one environment where they wanted to have desktop sync uh, type of features. But for most of our customers, we simply run a single virtual machine that sits next to, you know, say, a NetApp filer and sucks the data out of it. Okay, so the presumption is that you've got centralized storage somewhere. Correct, yes. Cool, all right, so um, the, the stuff that I've been doing is, is sort of trying to take totally unstructured file systems and make them behave kind of like object stores, and I, I hate to use those words so glibly in an audience of technologists, but for <laughs> my purposes, an object is just a piece of data that you can individually address and manipulate, and it has an address. So I'm wondering if there's any way to create like a persistent address across this huge collection of files so that those files could be externally referenced and you could know stuff and do stuff about them that sort of transcends the user's ownership of that file. That's, that's exactly what we've done. <laughs> so, so essentially, we've hashed every, uh, every path that we encounter. Uh, and uh, that hash is you know, so UUID, essentially, gets stored in a Cassandra database, and that in indexes that file. Uh, and in another database, we're storing all of the keys that have been extracted using natural language processing, uh, where the key is, is primary, and the, and the hash is actually a secondary uh, a column in the database. Uh, so now you can do a reverse lookup to say if you know, I'm looking up uh, you know, football or something like that, then it's going to cross-index and find all of those UUIDs that are, that are uh, uh, applicable to that, uh, that key. And then it's going to use the, link, the uh, uh, machine learning process that we have to reorder and re-rank the data depending on uh, your user and your user behavior, how you interact with that data, and other users that have used similar data, and re return the result of files in that search. One more question. So I'm trying to understand how the user interfaces with your system. So a user just drops a file in Dropbox and you will f find it out magically. And uh, when he is looking for that file, he will not go to Dropbox. So what he's going to? Yes, yeah, so exactly right. So a user would simply go about using the files wherever he leaves them. Uh, and only at the time where he wants to find will he open up our app. Uh, we have web app, and we also have iOS and Android apps. Uh, that you know, it's, it, the, the, the problem is we call this the dude where's my file problem. Like, you know, I know I was working on this file. Did I leave it in Dropbox? Is the latest version in email? Uh, and simply entering in some keys, you know, maybe another user that he was collaborating with into our app, uh, then provides a link back to that original source of data, where he could go ahead and download it, or he can create a, another shared link to send to another colleague. All right, and with that, um, we'll conclude our morning sessions. Thank you again, Mitch. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.